Okay, welcome back everybody. So our intention for this, uh, for the rest of the session for this afternoon is a panel discussion between the organizers and some other people, uh, just to talk about some of the themes that came up during the conference. Uh, one detail about the schedule, we are going to have the panel discussion from now 1.30 until about three o'clock, then we'll have closing remarks and then we'll go for coffee afterwards. And of course, for our online participants, I'm sorry you won't be able to join us for coffee, but if you wanna talk, we'll have people standing around in the room. Uh, there. So uh, at this point, I will simply uh, turn over to Maya and Michael, who are going to start with a little bit of a discussion about some of the themes that have come up. And then as people want to say things, uh, please post them in the chat, or I'll be wandering around uh, the audience with the microphone so that we can have a broader discussion. Really, here I keep finding myself with a microphone in my hand, un unprepared. Um, I was, I don't know, is Jeremy still around? Is he? But Jeremy would be in a position to answer the first thing that comes to mind. If not, okay, well, this also somehow, the, the other comment also refers to what, what, what he said. Well, let me just say it, and then I think he, he will concur because he said it. Uh, so when, when uh, Rodrigo uh, expressed uh, doubt that the uh, machines would spontaneously, through their internal workings, uh, develop in a direction of uh, of creating frameworks, uh, new frameworks that uh, conceptual frameworks that uh, would help uh, mathematicians understand what they're doing. That was the that was the uh, answer I was expecting him to say. Uh, the uh, and I was and I would just like to. This is more like a conclusion than like a beginning, but why not? That, that uh, as Jeremy, when Jeremy talked about living deliberately, I said if we want this this fourth uh, this fourth scenario uh, to be realized, which seems to be uh, most compatible with the the uh, I mean, all this is very hypothetical. So I'm, I have no idea when any of this is when or if any of this is actually going to take place. But assuming we are in 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 uh, in actualized fantasy, uh, out of zero fantasy, then if you wanted to develop in this direction, then we have to act. It's not just living deliberately, but it's also acting deliberately and recognizing that there may be contending forces that would, would uh, push it in a different direction. So that's one, that's one comment I wanted to make, but I think now Maya has something to say. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna add, it's, it's very interesting to hear sort of, uh, um, sociological perspective, uh, um, and, and there are just in general dealing with these uh, AI tools. Uh, part of being um, deliberate and, and mindful of what's happening is going to require a lot of crosstalk between mathematicians or between any community that um, is seeing the introduction of AI and AI developers or machine learning developers. So already uh, in the talk of Irina, for example. Um, she, she touched on this, but um, maybe just to uh, um, highlight it a little bit. Uh, at the moment, there are machines and people don't fully understand how they do what they do. <laughs> so there's a, there, this is a sense in which um, the machines or the technology itself can be a, a force that, that uh, we need to, to factor into that uh, kind of equation. It's not just uh, things in society that will shape uh, um, the changing face of math, but also the new technological developments and you know, what they're capable of. Did you want to add anything? Um, I was, I, it's been a terrific conference and a lot of it just for the, all the, the general discussion, not, not specifically focused. I, I came here knowing very little about machine proof, the kinds of things that people hear. I was, I was surprised at how much people emphasized human collaboration. And pleased, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad of that myself. But uh, and Peter Schultz talking about how he's working with the, the lean team the whole time, um, so that this is not blind to human comprehension at all. It's, it's, it's just facilitating it. Certainly, lots of machine, lots of machine manipulation of long algebraic formulas of multiple of long data. I mean, you, you can't be against that. And so I wasn't too worried about uh, Rodrigo's third scenario, where the machines are producing 
proofs, which we want to believe but cannot comprehend, um, certainly in popularization, you hear people pushing for that. Here I have not heard anyone even very interested in the possibility. Some people somewhat concerned about it. But uh, so that's... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just push have... for it. I'll push for it. I think it's a great idea. I think it will cause chaos. <laughs> <laughs> The, the okay. computers proving the birch is to die conjecture but humans not understanding why it's true i think that will i mean i don't i'm not entirely sure that's ever going to happen but i i really like i mean i'm a formalist i really like the idea but i i you, I, I think it's too i think it's out of reach so rodrigo was emphasizing the leibnizian versus a cartesian uh, approach so do you think that uh um i mean presumably these even if there's a, a formal proof that a human can't sort of uh, understand in in its totality, uh, that I, I should say I've seen one. Parts could yes, okay, great. <laughs> but I, parts I've can seen be understood. a proof of the I've seen a proof of the prime number theorem, which was just thirty megabytes of incomprehensible computer code j written by a computer. That the reason I've seen one is because uh, Jeremy. Uh, th there's been formalizations of the prime number theorem in other systems and this student of Avogad called Mario Carnero wrote uh, wrote a program that translated uh, the proof in metamath to a lean proof automatically and uh, and so yeah there was it, the the, met the metamath proof you can read but the lean translation you couldn't read at all and I just looked at it and thought well you know what if the future looks like this and, and part of me is kind of excited, but part of me is scared. But <laughs> Kevin, I have a question for you. What do you believe? What do you believe is this thing you're looking at? This this claimed proof. There's, there's 30 megabytes of well, I could I could compile I can give you 30 it. megabytes of garbage and say it's the Birchman to no, 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 but, so but I could run it, I could check it myself. I could see that, you know, I could you, you just said you can't. Well, I couldn't understand it, but I could run it. And, and okay, so, so I knew you, what is it you're believing in? I'm, I'm it believing it that it's a proof of the prime number theorem from the axioms of mathematics. But, but the, the actions you're doing, what, what, is, what amongst your actions makes you believe this is a proof? Well, I just, because I know how lean works. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, I, I, know what the, I know what lean's axioms are, and the, the axioms of mathematics. So and you have absolute faith that every step of the process oh, is yeah. appropriate. Oh, absolutely. Excellent. That, that's not that's not part of the that's not the issue, I don't think at all. I mean, so you you in terms of uh, of, of uh, phenomenology, you are uh, you have an intentional relation to the proof that does not include the content of, of the proof. It's uh, you, you somehow you are keeping in your mind the belief that this is the proof of uh the birth of the prime number theorem the prime number dire theory. conjecture whichever whichever uh <laughs> but you'd have but but nothing in your thought corresponds to uh what you're perceiving so that's a different notion of uh belief than than the one that i think uh andrew was trying uh -huh. to target aha uh -huh. now as a, as a formalist i be, i believe it but i don't understand it I mean, it's, I mean if, you know, but, pe people so, had that. People had that about you know. People thought that about the moon once, right? I don't mind that. Let's go. <laughs> so, if, for example, a, you you had your toes attached to a machine that tapped uh, the, uh, the the proof in in Morse code, but the same the same lean, lean proof, and you know, you would have the, basically the same relation uh, to it. It would still be, you know, at the end, maybe there would be a QED that you would recognize. Then. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just saying you can't you can't deny that it's is it mathematics? This is this is I mean in my opinion the answer is yes, but I'm a formalist. You know, I I I, I know that mathematicians like talking about images and pictures and how things fit together, <laughs> but but I but images and pictures scare me, right? Because because sometimes they're wrong. Whereas this 30 megabytes of gobbledygook. It's, it's in some sense absolutely right in the way that a picture never can be. So, 
So I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm struck, Kevin. It's it's really funny listening to your to your chaotic energy, and I, I wish it was in the room. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I've been you, you remind me um, years ago. Um, I was first. I had to teach for my sins. I had to teach my undergraduates what the blockchain was, what <laughs> cryptocurrencies were, and the question that I always would get is, my students said, you know, in 2014, why is this worth anything? Right. That was always the question. They were fine with the hash function and all that. Right. And so then I started asking my colleagues in, in sociology and psychology, and I said, well, why is it worth something? I asked economists. And the, the, the answer that I always thought proved that they weren't serious thinkers was that they would say, oh, it's worth something because people are willing to pay something for it. And that seems like the trivial answer, right? Like, why is, why is this worth something? Well, it's because you can sell it for something. And I wanted the deeper answer. And I, I think what you're doing when you say I have 30 megabytes and it's a proof, I mean, you're kind of trolling people here, right? Yeah, you absolutely. Are, you are, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, you're, 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 you're forcing us to actually say, okay, well, what is it? And then I think you're, you're sharpening some of these divisions between, let's call it the Cartesians and the Leibnizians on this, right? So from the point of view of the Cartesian, this is nothing, right? This is just yeah. taps on a, on, a, on, a, on a footprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but on the other hand, according to my formal definition of, I mean, I, I'm here stuck, te Kevin, stuck in the UK Kevin, teaching first year undergraduates. Yeah. Sorry, I will try to have a little bit wider discussion. So oh, I'm going to yeah, pass go the ahead. mic over to uh, Kumar. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so it sounds to me a little bit like, uh, what, what does it mean to, if, I, if you don't mind my abstracting the question a little bit, what does it mean to know something? I mean, if it's the old question of, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody has observed it, has it fallen? Um, so uh, the, it's a, that's a big question. And it goes to, I want to expand it even more to a comment that Michael made about what it is we're doing. What is the mathematical enterprise? And uh, um, is, it, is it the product, is it producing something? Uh, an object uh, um, in the form of some form piece of knowledge? Uh, is it something more subjective? Is it an experience? Is it a cognition or an awareness? And how, is that, how does that connect to um, uh, this uh, question of living deliberately that, uh, that uh, also was raised? Um, and I think the whole thing, what is the experience of, of mathematics? I wonder if we can just have a little bit of conversation about, about that. Anybody want to take this one? <laughs> I, I, so I can't just, oh, go on, let's see what Michael has to say. <laughs> well, I didn't, I, all that happened was I picked up the, was I picked up the mic, or the microphone was handed to me. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm, I, I would like actually to, uh, to, uh, to speak to that because he's the one who got this all started. And, you know, this is part of, part of the uh, Aleph Zero is changing, uh, altering mathematics beyond recognition, but does that include uh, altering the experience of mathematics. Mm -hmm. that, uh... Yeah, I think that was um, exactly the thing that that we should think about. That, that you know what Kumar is asking. Well, what is it? Well, what is it that we're doing exactly, and how how will it be affected? And can we, as Michael was suggesting earlier. But by thinking about it and trying to understand it, make slightly more conscious choices uh, to make that experience one which we want, whatever it is. Um. So I've always enjoyed playing computer games. And what Lean has taught me is that actually, one way of understanding mathematics is it's simply a computer game and a theorem the statement of a theorem is the level is a level of the game, and a you know a proof of the theorem is a solution to the level. And there's lots and lots you can watch on YouTube. You can watch humans playing computer games, and you can watch computers playing computer games. And there are some instances where computers play the games in completely different ways to humans, because they can they can manipulate the um the input you know the controller inputs in in ways that humans can't ever pull off. They can do superhuman things. And yet, I was still always, I mean, they were, in, in my opinion, they were still playing the games, they were just playing them differently. And if, if a computer beats the game, it's not beating the game. The game. And I, oh, yeah, so I think that's, a, that's an excellent, that's an excellent uh, 
analogy, actually, because your, uh, your purpose in playing the computer games is not uh, to, to read the transcript afterwards and to know that it actually happened, right? You, were, you have an experience uh, in, in playing the game. So I actually, I actually proposed an alternative which very neatly uh, maps, uh, the, the, it appears to, to map the uh, different strategies of Google and Facebook, so, so why not? Uh, instead of, instead of uh, investing in, in formalizing, uh, why not invest in virtual reality. So imagine uh, play an extreme Cartesian uh, a, a, a version of of uh, of the mathematical experience in which you are wearing a, a helmet, and I suggest the possibility of of proving the uh, geometrization conjecture by actually squeezing three manifolds, and then the the software would translate that into a satisfactory uh, satisfactory uh, formal proof that you wouldn't have to understand because you've already had the experience. <laughs> and it, uh, so, but then somehow, uh, I should say that if, you're, if your purpose is, uh, is to troll mathematics, you should be a little bit careful because the, uh, the press is taking you not only very seriously, but taking you as representative of, uh, of mathematics uh, and its, its aspirations as a whole. So if you, if you, if you think, think that you do represent uh, mathematics, that's, that's of course, you're right. But if you think that you are a formalist and, and somehow maybe an embattled formalist, then you know that you should, you should, uh, you should, you should make people aware of that. I think something, something very wrong happened somehow that I was somehow became some sort of poster child. For, for part of this game, because honestly, you shouldn't trust me as far as you can throw me, really. So, Glenn, I just wanted to pick something up here that you said. I, we can see you, Andrew. Yes. Uh, uh, um, one of the things you, that you mentioned just on the topic of mathematics as a video game, which I think is a really, really useful point to think about. Um, a while ago, uh, you know, we you know we we build machines to play video games and. Um, one of the things we discovered is that you know, there's something called curiosity-driven learning, which you may know about, right? Which is the, you know, what the machine does is it, it, it tries to interact with the system in a way that it finds surprising. So it's, it's sort of a nice metaphor. Oh, like, you know, humans, like we, we're curious, let's build a machine that's curious. And so it, it does really well at Super Mario Brothers um, and the old 8-bit Super Mario Brothers. And um, if you look at it, the reason curiosity-driven learning works so well in Super Mario is because it's a really well-built game. And this makes me think about something Emily came up with, maybe I think it was a discussion last night about, look, if you have really good definitions, then the game might really flow for you, right? So maybe one of the effects here of switching into this new mode, mathematics is a video game that could be played by computers just as well as by humans, is that you guys become more like game designers as opposed to game players. It used to be we played games set up by the physicists, now actually we're designing levels that could be played by a human or by a machine. So that might be one of the futures here. It just makes me think. But there's, a, there's an art to making a good level, just like there's an art to making a good conjecture. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, I mean, that, that last remark goes in a little different direction. I wanted to say I really like to play soccer and uh, if machines come on the field and beat me, I don't don't feel an emotional bond to uh, that improvement to the game. And and then, well, it, we could replace all the human soccer players by machine soccer players, and they could have a game that is entirely different and meaningless to me, largely. That's what happened with chess. That, that's really what how I feel about the same issues that you're talking about. Hmm, not sure I like that comparison. <laughs> uh, I'd like to turn to the chat because there's a little bit of uh, discussion there and then uh, Emily wanted to make a comment and then we'll see where we go after that. So uh, for those in the room, uh, we have John Seidels or Sidless, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, Counterexample to Kevin Buzzard's claim that lean is rigorous in a way that a picture never can be. In regard to Robert Lewis and Min Chao Wu's ongoing work, a bi-directional extensible interface between lean and Mathematica. Is anyone working along the lines of a bi-directional extensible interface between Lee and G, aka LabVIEW? As a reference, the point is that for engineers, a bitmap screen grab can communicate rigorous code. There's not obvious way why 
commutative diagrams cannot be communicated rigorously in G. Kevin, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, so uh, these, at the minute, the lean community is in some transitional period where we where Microsoft have released Lean 4, and we're currently uh, porting a million lines of mathematics uh, from Lean 3 to Lean 4. So once once we're on Lean 4, we know we'll be staying on Lean 4 for a while. Uh, people are going to start uh, connect, connecting Lean to all manner of other systems. This is the plan. And I mean, yes, certainly we already have enough machine. I mean, maybe Johan can say something about widgets. I don't know. Would it be easier to talk to someone in the room? Uh, but already, yeah, already we can draw pictures of commutative diagrams. But uh, but when I say proof by picture, I was thinking more of, I mean, there are, there's this book, Proofs Without Words, where, where really some of the proofs, I mean, a, a very famous example of, the, of, a, of a proof without words is when you fill a hexagon with kind of two by, you know, stick two small equilateral triangles together and you make a lozenge. And you, uh, the, the theorem is that if you fill a hexagon with such lozenges, then there's an equal number pointing in each direction. And there's this beautiful proof by picture where you just fill a hexagon randomly with lozenges and you shade them appropriately. And then you look at the picture and you realize that it just looks like a big pile of cubes, a 3D picture of a pile of cubes. And then you can start thinking about uh, projections. Uh, you start, you start imagining looking at the cubes from different angles, from the top and from the sides, and you, and you realize that the theorem is completely obvious. Uh, but formalizing that proof in a theorem proof would be phenomenally difficult. That's the kind of proof by picture I'm talking about. And as a formalist, you know, part of me wants to say that such a proof by picture uh you know is 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 not in some sense mathematics in, in the sense that you'd have a you know in the, in the sense that if you define mathematics to be zfc or something then it's then the picture is not a proof at all but on the other hand as humans we kind of we can clearly see uh we can clearly see that this uh that this that this is a you know is clearly a rigorous proof in some sense so that's that's what I mean by proof by picture, and, and this I get. I suspect that this G thing is something else. But you're absolutely right. You know, the, the human computer interface needs to be much more than what we have now. And uh, I imagine that in in the future, you know, once we've once we finish with this period of transition, and we're with a much faster system, which has a much better interface to the outside world, and then these links will, I believe, they they will come because the lean community is incredibly sort of dynamic and that sort of thing. I just want to well, with, the, with, uh, with my comment, I just wanted to suggest that uh, I'm no doubt there are people in lean who are saying, boy, if only we had a nice graphical interface that made things easier without sacrificing rigor. Yeah. Well, you could save a lot of trouble just going over to the engineering school and hiring a couple of graduate students uh, who are familiar with G. The way uh, G has uh, been dealing with this is, uh, is um, when you commit to GitHub, what you commit is the picture. Uh, and then you have a certified library that converts the picture into an underlying, underlying language that I think in the case of G is C++ or something. But there's no reason it couldn't convert a G picture into lean. Uh, and then uh, 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 that helps you work with pictures right from the start without sacrificing rigor. That's why when you really want to do valid software, lots of engineers use G uh, because it lets you work with pictures without sacrificing rigor. Anyway, turn it over to a graduate student. I don't think you'll harm them. Uh, and they might really bring some good ideas back to your group. But they I mean, the lean community is full of young people with, with ideas like this. And so a, a lot of things just seem to be happening organically. You know, young members of staff need projects for students. And these sorts of things do tend to happen. I, I shall remember the name. Thank you. I, I just want to point out briefly, I know it's Emily's turn, that there is a, a, raising his hands is the author of a book uh, of 99 proofs of one very simple theorem 
and uh, only one of them, one of them is a uh, formal proof. There are 98 other ways of proving this theorem, and I think each of them has uh, its roots in the history of mathematics, but he's raising his hand, so he'll, he'll speak up later, I guess. And the author of that book is here? Yep. Oh, marvelous. That is a great book. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it quite recently. Okay, uh, on a slightly different topic, just a question for the panel. Um, this morning, uh, Jeremy's unnamed interlocutor defined a traditional mathematician as somebody who's employed full time, I think, to prove theorems. And I'm wondering if we could speculate on the prospects for full time employment proving theorems in a future with uh, these sophisticated computer tools that can also prove theorems. Of course, we think that it's worth doing, but will somebody pay for it? Do you want to do, you want to do that? Do you want to yeah. Sure, go ahead, Philip. Philip, you have... Your hand is up, Philip. Maybe... No, no, that's just a, that's the that's the mouse. Oh, oh that's not the <laughs> that's just high Okay. Okay. And all right. So see so yeah. One, so let's turn to professional uh, mathematicians. Yes. Well, I was just going to quickly um, mention that there's always a a, a question of uh, how long it takes to do anything, and and that's uh, kind of. Uh, um, a constraining factor in terms of what machines like at any given time, there's certain stuff that they can do and <laughs> um, and. Even now, it's uh, it's widely recognized that sort of intermediate uh, representations are crucial in um, machine learning methods. And so, as if, if you know, we imagine some kind of Aleph zero that uses machine learning to come up with uh, to to prove something that we don't know whether it's true or not, and produces this uh, so, some let's say lean code that that is a proof. Um, the how fast is or how how feasible is it for for that to, to happen there could still be a room so so presumably for that to, to occur for any kind of challenging math results um there are probably going to need to be intermediate representations these are sort of abstractions and so mathematics kind of gets at what rodrigo is suggesting there's still a role for mathematicians to be contributing these sort of intuitions and um yes yeah, sometimes machines discover intuitions we wouldn't have had and that's kind of an intriguing uh, sort of challenge for machine learning, but but there's also uh, a bit of a shift in that uh, humans are um, more and more valued for being able to provide that type of contribution. So yeah, so I'm not sure. So it might just change the nature of the work without uh, yeah there being um, an elimination of that role of mathematician. <laughs> Just, I, I'm, I'm thinking about Emily's comment. So having seen this in the humanities in history, so we, we started doing statistical analyses of historical data. And so this, this question came up there. I remember I, I gave a talk once and a historian in the back said, how many books of history do we have to throw out because of you? And the implication was that this would radically change the nature of history. If there were winners and losers, um, some people, you know, there were power shifts. Some people who had power lost a little power. Some people who didn't have power lost even more and all of the different permutations. I think people in history are writing fewer monographs going forward. So like just purely formal aspects of the, of the task have changed, but history is still there. So it would be hard for me to imagine, like, for example, I might imagine mathematicians have to prove fewer things to get tenure. That would be a, an easy prediction of the machine learning era. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yes, I mean, the it it shook up some of the, and this is why uh, Rodrigo's point in his talk struck me. It shook up the trusted network of specialists that ratified what was history, um, and some of those people lost a lot of power in part because their theses didn't hold up, and I doubt that it's going to be as dramatic here, but there were certainly. It provided a new source of validity for people doing interesting historical work. And so, yeah, so there were losers in some of them. I don't, I don't think it was actually all that bad. I, I couldn't hear the question. Sorry, yeah. So, I mean, what we did, I mean, I was just one of many people doing quantitative analysis. So we, we started doing text analysis of historical documents. 
So take 100,000 court documents and you know, get a machine to read them and look at patterns of word usage and build historical, make, make claims that were previously the domain of solely historical close reading. So this would be, you know, we were the Leibnizians, they were the Cartesians. They spent 50 years, you know, in the courtroom archives, building a mental model. We show up with a formal crunch through of the same thing. So that, that was kind of, that was roughly the, the kinds of conflicts that were emerging in the last 10 years. We have a comment in the chat that definitions, uh, choosing a name seems to be fundamental for a working mathematician. I don't think mathematicians will do it well. Machine, machine. machine sorry. Machines, well, I don't think mathematicians, well, lots of mathematicians don't do it very well either. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I think there's a point here of, of when machines come in, uh, then it's always the case that they seem to be taking over some job that humans are doing, and yet humans seem to find a way, nevertheless, of doing some maybe not the same work anymore, but still related work. But let me not interject too much. Well, very, very briefly, if, they, if, if machines identify principal axes in some enormous data set, then they can also be trained to give some, some Greek or Latin name to uh, that, you know, that with, with resonance. I want to get back to Emily's point. The, uh, 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 Andrew, said at the beginning that mathematicians are putting our heads in the sand by failing to recognize that the proofs are uh, not uh, incontrovertible for, for whatever reason. But I think much uh, deeper in the sand is uh, the uh, failure to acknowledge the crisis of a higher education pretty much everywhere. And there are different, it, it, it plays out in different ways, but the model of higher education which sustains uh, mathematic, the kind of mathematical research that Emily was talking about uh, is, if, if you think too hard about it, you'll see that it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, uh, even when I started teaching, the idea was that uh, we were going to teach service courses, and then we would be allowed to, uh, to do our research, and that was somehow uh, the bargain. Well, that, you know, there, there are some questions about the ethics of that bargain, but more and more, uh, and in, in, in other fields, especially, uh, the te tenured or tenure track faculty are being replaced by temporary faculty, which is uh, not so, so different from, uh, you know, in, in, in the humanities, it's, it's a total catastrophe. And the, I, the fact that, the, that the, uh, you know, it's been remarked years ago that, uh, that the uh, graduate schools depend on the labor, underpaid labor of of graduate students who sacrifice a certain number of, of years of their lives in order to get this uh, degree which that for the most part they won't be able to use to get uh, to get tenure because the position the positions aren't there uh, so in, in that sense it's a uh, independently of, of what the machines do the, the there's uh, you know the, the the system I don't see how the system is sustainable so uh, you know, before before worrying uh, up, as, as, as Tim did, that the, uh, that the mathematical community as such won't survive. I wonder what, you know, whether the institutions, you know, whether it's more likely that the institutions will be underwater physically or will just, uh, or will just collapse because of internal contradictions. It's, uh, it's, uh, which will come first? I, I think it's interesting that both Groff and Deke and Schultz uh, introduced many new concepts into mathematics and they both thought very very hard about their names this 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 point on the chat about about naming things there is, there is definitely something to it that i don't really understand but th there is some kind of art uh, to naming but going back to emily's point let, let me stick my neck out and and say that all these ai people it's very easy to find people who work in computer science departments who will, who are telling us that well you know now computers can see can understand you know they they can drive cars and they can write newspaper articles and so therefore you know within 10 years time they're going to be proving interesting theorems and and i actually think that this is just bs really i think that these people have no understanding of of how difficult you know it's interesting to philosophize about you know whether mathematicians are going to become unemployed because computers are better, you know, it might happen. I mean, it happened with chess, 
But I just think math is, I think math is much harder than a lot of these AI people think. And I mean, to give an example, you, you might imagine how long would it take before we get a computer to, to reel out, you know, 30 gigabytes of code that purports to prove that virtual infinity is an entire conjecture now, or a conjecture which has not been solved. But actually, uh, computers are a million miles away from even being able to state the virtual infinity is an entire conjecture because it involves evaluating an L function at a point where we only, you know, it was only 25 years ago that we managed to prove that the question made sense. And the, str the strong version of the virtual infinity is an entire conjecture, you know, re relating the, 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 you know, the, the value of the first non-vanishing derivative to the order of a group that we don't actually know is finite. You know, in some sense, we haven't even stated this conjecture yet because we haven't proved enough theorems to prove that the statement makes sense. So the thought, you know, the idea that computers will be proving it to me just sounds completely ridiculous. Uh, I just wanted to, to jump in there and say, yes, I, I certainly agree. There's lots of kind of hyperbole in the sort of broad masses of people you might talk to in in the press or in computer science as well, unfortunately. Um, but I, I think uh, Jordy uh, Williamson said this very well when he was sort of emphasizing that um, new accomplishments uh, in terms of machine learning helping with math are gonna require mathematicians talking with machine learners. It's, it's gonna require both types of expertise together. Um, and these are hard problems. It's not, but it, so it's important not to be, um, to just say, oh, it's impossible, or to say anything's possible. There, there are concrete challenges that we can try to solve by working together. So, so a Andrew mentioned this in his talk. He said computers are supposed to be our servants. And I think that is something that can become, that, that might become viable. That uh, you know, the, the idea should is- keep that in mind. <laughs> yes, the, I agree. The, it's important. The, the, the idea of getting some kind of chatbot that will teach my students algebraic geometry you know, they have some hard question in algebraic geometry and they ask the chatbot and the chatbot just you know knows the literature and knows lots and lots of examples of algebraic objects and you know can look at its database for counter examples to conjectures and things like this i think that's very much a viable thing but this certainly won't be putting humans out of a job this will be this will be making our lives easier which is what computers are supposed to be doing right that's the whole point of mechanization that, that i think I want, that's where I we're going to address yeah you know, I, I, I want to address, you know, the future of mathematics, I guess, is Michael's uh, negative view of high school, et cetera. But I mean, I think this, this machine learning is, is exciting for mathematics. Um, and the, the particular reason that I'm excited is that very bright young people are going into the subject. My own department, we've hired a couple of people who, I mean, it changes the complexion of physics in our department, of uh, statistics in our department, let me tell you. I mean, these, these young people are terrific. They, they're thinking at the, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not in love for subject, but, uh, but I'm in love for the fact that the brightest young people who might not have gone into math a few years ago are going into mathematics, albeit in this particular area, but I think it's positive for all of us. And I think if you look at how universities develop, a hot subject is where resources go and it's where students go. So actually we are just at the start of a massive improvement in the condition of mathematics in universities. Sorry to completely contradict you, Michael. <laughs> let, let, me, let me follow up on this. This is a, this is a thought I shared with, with Meyer earlier. You know, why, you understand why uh, mathematics is a major contributor to uh, climate change. Well, uh, pure mathematical research. Well, to follow up on that, the, 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 uh, the process I described previously, it's not as it's not like in the humanities where they produce too many uh, PhDs and then they go on and uh, and uh, and uh, unionize Starbucks or or something. The uh, in uh, the mathematicians who don't find jobs in the in the in the academy uh, don't have to go to Starbucks because they can, they can go to work in Wall Street and devise new ways uh, for. Uh, for uh, to uh, promote the investment in fossil fuels, and I think it would be interesting to trace uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 to track the relation between the creation of many more PhDs in mathematics with uh, with uh, uh, the consumption of fossil fuels around the world. But the uh, but so if if that's 
if the, what's going to happen to these mathematicians? What are they, the ones who are trained in mathematics going into machine learning? What are they going to teach the machines? What are they going to teach the machines to do? Um, Hard algebraic uh, geometry. Uh, that's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a huge market for that. <laughs> so so I, I wonder if I could ask, bring the discussion back to tacit knowledge, which I find very fascinating because it's what what may be the boundary between the, the human and the machine. Um, so I'd like to hear the views of the panelists on what tacit knowledge is. Specifically, Maya, you made an interesting comment. You know, uh, you said it's possible the machine will develop intuition. Now, what what is intuition? Does it mean finding in a specific instance a connection that it wasn't told before? Does that count as intuition? Or, or is that an example of which um, the machine found something and has no idea what, what it means? Uh, what is intuition and, how, and what is its role in, in tacit knowledge? So I use that in kind of a, a, a fairly broad sense, but I think that um, there's several important aspects of it. So um, one thing is just, uh, among the many possible next steps that you could do in a proof to have a sort of a sense of what are promising ones to 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 try um and that's something that mathematicians that sort of uh um let's call it it's a form of intuition but that is something that mathematicians refine it's subconscious largely but they refine over many years of training on explicit problems and then that's what allows them to push forward. So I, I found it very interesting in Gower's talk to be really dissecting what are the, you know, what are the steps and what's the thought process in coming up with a proof. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's one, one aspect um, that I was referring to. But I think another thing that's, uh, um, so Rodrigo mentioned tacit uh, as knowledge, um, also in the context of um, maybe that can't be formalized. And there's this intriguing kind of tension there, like, uh, so possibly uh, um, with this, I don't know, G, I'm not familiar with this, but possibly with other sort of forms of uh, um, IO, basically, for, for machines, we could uh, express intuition in different ways, some of these, um, yeah, intuitive aspects. But, um, but, but I think that but that nevertheless, what, what a mathematician does, in a sense, is convert this built up intuition that's been built up at a subconscious level over years. And then um, the job of producing a proof is sort of extracting that into a uh, something that's expressible in a formal way as a proof. And so that's, that's kind of the mathematicians are, you know, the, it's a machine that converts coffee into proofs. <laughs> it's also a machine that converts uh, it, these sort of uh, um, long developed intuitions uh, into proofs. So, uh, Does intuition mean the collection of instances in which I, I saw what was happening and then figured out the next step, or does it mean something more abstract than that? So I think I wanted to use it very broadly, um, but um, just as a, um, a promising thing that, that might be a sort of a, a next frontier that also I think is certainly to become useful as assistance to mathematicians, um, machines would have to develop some form of abstraction. And um, one could call this intuition. And then I guess one can, the way I would compare it with humans is that sort of subconscious intuition that a mathematician builds up over years that can partially be expressed. We, we do that with, our, you know, with each other. We describe things in sort of uh, uh, art, artistic ways almost sometimes. It's funny, it seems to me that this, the way in which you're describing the tacit knowledge seems to me very much something which you could program into a computer and which a computer is good for, in that it has a huge body of knowledge, all of which is accessible to it instantaneously in order to pull up. And then so that's, you've got all this knowledge in the background that you, that you don't even are aware that you have until you need it and then you use it. There's a big difference in terms of how it's uh, structured. So, so even in uh, sort of... Uh, Questions that uh, don't have to do with um, with with math, uh, you do, you can have some sort of uh, a data set which is in a format that's just yes you have all maybe have all this information but uh, dealing with it in that format would just be uh, 
not feasible in, in any kind of reasonable time. But uh, if an oracle gives you a certain kind of uh, way of modifying, transforming the, uh, the original input into something else, then suddenly it becomes a problem that you can do in, in feasible time. And so there's that, like, what are these uh, sort of useful representations? That's there's a whole field of machine learning, but it's also kind of related to cognitive science. So isn't this, is, isn't this what happened in chess? Computers started playing sort of the way that humans would call intuitively. But they weren't using intuition at all. They were just using something else. Do computers play chess intuitively? So I wouldn't use intuition for that. I was I was more wanting to use that word uh, just to uh, emphasize this link between uh, um, underlying representations that that a machine might need to make use of and the role that intuition plays for mathematicians. That was kind of the link I wanted to emphasize. I, I wouldn't go so far as to impute um, consciousness or intuition or anything like that, in, you know, verbatim to a machine. Okay, go Simon, and then uh, Ernie Davis online had a, has a hand raised. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited by this question of tacit knowledge. So, um, right, uh, we actually, so ironically, if we were paper out today on tacit knowledge and thinking in this conference about it, so formal definition, uh, Poyani, right? It's it's what we know but cannot say, right? It's this body of knowledge that we have access to but can't verbalize or formalize. So that's the kind of what tacit knowledge is from the psychological, cultural point of view. And it, it appears to us in forms like emotions and intuition. So that's one aspect of tacit knowledge. It's the sense of you, you've done enough mathematics, so you, your student comes, they, they bring you a line of attack, and you say that's not going anywhere, even though you can't explain how you know. So that's, that's one aspect. But this, this other aspect is the fact that tacit knowledge is transmitted. So there are traditions of tacit knowledge. A mathematical community has a tradition of tacit knowledge. And so this is also a puzzle. It's a second order puzzle, right? It's not just I know it and I can't say it, but it's also like, I know it, I can't say it, but I can also teach it. And so this is this role of mentorship and apprenticeship. And so one thing we haven't talked about is, okay, as if these machines start intro introducing themselves into the mathematical community, how does that affect that apprenticeship and mentorship process as well? So it isn't just doing enough math gives you the tacit knowledge, it's doing enough math, but then these kind of little interventions, right, that good advisors make. And so I, I, that's a really open question. Maybe Rodrigo has thoughts on this about how that will affect things in the future. Okay, I'd like to turn to Ernie next. Uh, yeah, so the point was raised a minute ago about the difference between having all the knowledge and being able to use it properly. It's a thing that I've been wondering about for many years, which is search engines for theorems. At the moment, they're terrible. Uh, if you want to find whether something has been proved, you go to math overflow. Uh, uh, unless, you, unless you're really lucky with how you phrase it in Google. And I was wondering whether any thought had been given to how that functionality would connect to uh, a project like Lean and so on. Okay, I'm going to let Mike intervene very briefly on on intuition. That there is another. There are some other philosophers in the 17th century, who's uh, who who were neither Descartes nor uh, Leibniz, who had more to say about dispositions and uh, which are learned not through, uh, through the kind of reason that is, uh, is described in, in that. But, that, but that's, that's a whole uh, other discussion. So. Yeah, so as just a, a concrete answer to Ernie's question, partial answer, but a, a concrete start and an answer to Ernie's question. Um, so in the formalization uh, field, there are tools called sledgehammers. Uh, the idea is you're trying to prove a theorem you know, you know it, it follows from one or two facts in the library, but you don't want to be bothered by just, you know, manually searching for it. Um, and so you call it a sledgehammer. Uh, and the, uh, the problem is, you know, there, there are tens of thousands of theorems in the library. So finding the ones you, um, um, uh, you want uh, is hard. And what the tools currently do is uh, they go through, so based on what you're trying to prove and what's immediately around you in the current file, you know, looks at the symbols and so on. Uh, first, there's kind of a heuristic filter, which you then go through the, you know, the library of, you know, tens of thousands of theorems, and you try to pick out about 200 
that that might be relevant uh, to the task at hand. Um, and there are the techniques. There are symbolic heuristic techniques. You do scoring techniques in proximity. Uh, pe people have also used machine learning to try to learn from context, learn features, and so on. So there are different methods. Um, then you send it to an external theorem prover like Vampire. You know, Vampire tries to prove it, proves it. It comes back and says, I proved it using these three lemmas um, in your library. And then internally, you try to reconstruct the proof. So that's one example of a technology where you know you are searching for things that are relevant to to a task at hand, and you have to get it right. I mean, it's you know it's 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 a it's a precise question. You're trying to prove the particular thing, um, and it's an active area of research. They're, they're not nearly as good as we want them to be, um, and uh, so I think in the field it is recognized that this is I mean this is uh, a, a big open problem, a big line of research to to develop formal methods that are, that will search for things. Um, uh, not just, you know, syntactically, but, you know, based on, on semantic meaning. Um, so, so, so it's the intuition, short is, right? Intuition. It's Te well, teaching it's, right, of intuition. It's, it's you're trying to codify uh, something like that, that intuition. So, yeah, so the, the short answer is that it is an active field of research and, and one that people value. Andrew wanted to make a comment on that. Actually agree with that. Yeah, I, I was very inspired by Simon's remarks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing about tacit understanding what you give on to your students, something I spend a lot of time doing. And, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, I like to think of myself as a guide rather than a supervisor because you're kind of guiding them through this jungle of concepts. But it makes me, I mean, what, what makes me smile is the number of times I've been wrong with my tacit understanding. So I try and guide them, but I send them right into a tree or, you know, make them avoid the path they should have been walking on. So, I mean, there's an interesting thing about tacit understanding is it's tacit, like perceived understanding or, I mean, there's a right, right way to phrase it, but I think, you know, that, that sort of intuitive, I think I know what I'm talking about thing, maybe I am right 85% of the time, but, you know, there's, there's a probability distribution there, there's not proof. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's the current that I've that I've most liked here is where this is really amplifying human understanding, and 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 not just not just that humans are guiding it, but that also humans are getting comprehensible output from it, besides incomprehensible. Um, and on that thing of the prime number theorem, I'm guessing that that proof was developed by consulting other proofs, previous proofs. And so you get a compressed, incomprehensibly compressed version, but it got there from other proofs that were known. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a human written proof written in a different language and then translated from one language to another by a computer, which then garbled it. Yeah, and to me, this is, I, I'm leaving very much a bigger fan of computerized mathematics than I, than I came here because I see these interactions both going both directions. So we have a comment from Tim Daly on the chat. Tim, do you want to say something? Maybe I not, in which case I've been commenting yeah. in the uh, in the chat itself. Uh, one of the things I don't see anywhere in the um, neural network is abductive reasoning, where you're searching for a hypothesis from explanations, and I think that there's a a real um, opportunity, I guess, for that being where mathematicians would be cooperative with um, the neural networks, where they're doing proposing various theorems to be proven um, uh, from examples they may have worked out themselves. Come on. So I, I want to probe still what Simon said was the definition of. <laughs> tacit knowledge it's knowledge that you have but you can't say is that what you said yeah this is just um uh in the original book the tacit dimension uh, um that's his formal definition we he says um we have to begin with the fact that we we know more than we can say well, i mean i i go back to a f basic question maybe it's a naive question yeah how do you know something if you can't express it so um, a really simple example, and maybe this is one, one you might be thinking of too, is the frame problem in AI, right? I say, you know, you're like, tell a robot how to go make a cup of coffee, right? And you're gonna give it instructions and you're gonna forget an enormous number of things. You're gonna forget to instruct it an enormous number of things that you didn't even know you knew. Like, 
before you walk through the door, open the door. Right. Right. And you only notice those. I mean, those are right. cases where the tacit knowledge becomes explicit. Yeah. But um, in general, like a lot of tasks that we have, um, we th our claim, at least I think it's right, is, you know, maybe 90 percent of the information in that task is not accessible to the participant in the way that you can say, oh, I know how to swing a tennis racket, for example. You don't know all of the moves that go into swimming a tennis racket. Right, right. So this is, I mean, the, the claim here is that this is happening. No, but, yeah. but, but yeah. you know how to ride a bicycle. The reason I know you know it is because you ride the bicycle, right? So, right. so that, is but, that still tacit knowledge? Yes, yes, because the, the, the principles by which you ride that bicycle, you would have difficulty articulating in full. And I should probably pass this to. You, you couldn't write a book add... that explained how to ride a bicycle, right? Right. Well, then you're also partly transmitting some of your um, sort of uh, um, these maybe partially subconscious skills. You're transmitting them, even though what you write, it's not the whole story, but you're hoping that it will kind of uh, it's the germ of the idea. And then the, the person who's reading what you write will uh, then, you know, have an advantage riding a bike. But I was just going to say that I think these um, athletic endeavors are a really good example. And so, it, it, you know, this thing of going to make a coffee, you could potentially list all of those things you have to like watch out for the top of the door, open the handle, get the water. You could maybe list all of those things, but the part that's hard is the the physiological movement because we 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 have that ability at an unconscious level. Um, and so I think there's this really interesting interplay between unconscious, like subconscious, in humans and and conscious is uh, language ability is conscious. And um, I, I feel like mathematicians to a large extent are extracting stuff from the subconscious and converting it into a, a, a language form. But... I actually disagree with that because I think that these physical examples are quite misleading. Mm -hmm. I think that th there's a, a physical knowledge we have in our body about how to ride a bicycle, which we cannot articulate because it's part of uh, the way our body is controlled. I don't think that that helps when we're trying to think of something that we're doing with our mind. You know, could we do all of it with our mind? Uh, let, and Jeremy, and then yeah, no, okay. So let me just give an, another example. So, I mean, you, you, you demonstrate that you know how to prove a theorem by proving the theorem. But then the question is, can you explain to somebody how you figured it out? Right? You might have a hard time explaining to somebody else how, how they could have come to prove the theorem that you just proved. So you have some knowledge of how to go about it because you succeeded, but the question as to can you articulate how you you came you got there, um, that's a different question. Uh, I was just going to follow up, Jerry. You make a valid point that each individual has their own body shape, and so they they have knowledge of how to walk or ride a bike or whatever for their own body. But there's also uh, even within a given individual, there's still a lot of m sort of muscle memory and so on, which is stored at various levels of the nervous system that we don't have conscious access to. So there, there is still that kind of tension, even, yeah. <laughs> with, with regards to Jeremy's point, sometimes after you've proved a theorem, the entire thing looks so blindingly obvious that you can't ever really remember the state that you were in before. <laughs> it's, 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 how could you not prove the theorem, right? That's because it's just so easy and trivial and everything fits together. But all of the ideas you tried that didn't work somehow you know, were irrelevant and sort of melt away. So it is, a, it is a very strange situation. Just another example, Melanie Mitchell talked about opening, trying to get a robot to open a bottle, right? And I mean, it's interesting that, that people have been trying to do that and failing. And uh, you, know, you think that should be workable, outable by writing enough stuff down. So if people have been seriously trying and failing that, I think that that's a wonderful example she gave. I'm thinking, so just let me, Give us the athletic metaphor briefly, and then I'll come to it. Right. So, when I was when I was had a, you know playing tennis when I was young, right. Your coach will say, "Keep your eye on the ball." Right. Um, another thing they might say is, "Follow through with the swing." Right. And what this is doing is actually, you know, if you keep your eye on the ball, it's orienting your skeleton. It's doing all. It's having all sorts of effects on your body that neither you nor your coach are aware of. Right. So. Um, when your coach says, keep your eye on the ball, like you might think, oh, of course, that's because you keep your eye on the ball because it lets you see the ball. No, that's not what's happening at all. And so, um, but it's like a little intervention 
that moves a much more complicated system in the right way. Um, so if we take a mathematical case, right, it may not be the human body, it may be, let's say, a mental model. So I'm working with my advisor, we have this mental model, he or she wants to push my mental model, right? How are they going to manipulate my mental model in a way that's going to lead me to some insight? Well, they, they, might, they might be saying something like, keep your eye on the ball, right? Actually saying something that's totally incidental. It, on the surface, it seems like it's conveying information, but what it's actually doing is something completely different in this system, this mental model that we can't fully articulate. And if you flip it around, it's a little bit like saying, you know, if we could fully articulate our mental model, well, we would have proved every theorem about the reals, right? We would have just, you know, I have a mental model of the reals. If I knew everything explicitly, then the mathematical part would be easy. Um, just two, two, two thoughts there. My, my piano teacher up. used to say, concentrate on what you're playing. And I could see that that was not going to change the way my fingers were moving. And yet somehow it would. They, right, exactly. Yeah, right. Don't forget the, the integers, some of them are even, right? And it's enlightening for a mathematician. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Is there, some, is there some area, a part of tacit knowledge that, you know, you can codify, it's from your experience, you're a guide, you can articulate, from my experience, I know that if you start at point B, that's not the best place to start, because I've got, you know, 40 years in this. So you can codify that, um, the next steps. Is that part of tacit knowledge or is it the part that you cannot codify <laughs> by definition? So maybe it's, you know, you get to a certain point with AI, you can codify tacit knowledge, but then beyond that, you can't codify the rest of it or like, do you, do you know what I mean? Sound like one of my referees. Or, you, you sound like one of our referees, and it's true. There's this boundary, so the, things move in and out of the tacit knowledge space. And again, this is all account. You know, Poliani draws this out of his. I mean, he's making a point about the free market. He's making a point about a lot of tacit knowledge systems. And you know, one of his points is like, be careful what you modify, right? Because you may be completely mistaken about the nature of the system because most of the knowledge is tacit. So that's you know, if I. When I first came to this meeting, my worry was like, don't touch anything. You guys are great. Like, don't do anything because your theory of what you're doing when you do mathematics is probably wrong in the same way that, you know, it's, um, you know, to use Kevin's example, right? Like you ask a great piano player, what's the nature of piano playing? Well, really it's about concentrating on the piece you're playing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take, I don't know, modafinil, we're going to concentrate harder. We're going to make even greater music. And you're like, no, 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 that's not actually how it works. But as a practitioner, that's that paradox of tacit knowledge i see actually you have some uh, things, things uh, to say no i was going to switch to switch the subject so if there's more on tacit knowledge then one should say that first okay so this is actually a question from michael so sorry for a little bit of a shift but i think one of the um, purposes here is we were trying to have a conversation about the impact of machine learning not on just on math in a narrowly construed sense but you know on, on uh uh, what the notion of math is and, and, and um, its relation to a much broader context. And Michael has been, uh, I would say, one of the few mathematicians who has been drawing attention to these issues in his um, substack for, I think, more than a year now. So I'm wondering if you could say a bit about what you have learned from that experience, trying to ha have this discussion with the broader math community trying to have the discussion with a broader math community this is maybe the first time it's uh i uh i think there are a lot of mistaken ideas or misleading ideas have to be cleared away before one can have uh, the broader discussion and so when people say uh you know is this uh going to eliminate mathematics as a human profession then that that uh, that uh, that short circuits uh, a long and necessary discussion of what it is that allows mathematics to be a human profession in the first place. So, uh, and that's the kind of uh, that's, and then when, or I, you know, I've already talked about that, or when people say, well, chess, go, therefore, 
mathematics, uh, there's a, a or cloth or, or handloom weavers or you know whatever or or, or buggy whip manufacturers. There are all these these these, these examples of uh, you know why should mathematics be be different? Well, there's a discussion of the history of technology and and uh, what are the forces that drive technology? What are the forces uh, that resist uh, or, or try to divert the technology in one direction or another. Um, I don't see within mathematics as such an institutional framework for having this, this discussion because the professional as, as associations, even if it were decided to have a discussion in the pages of the notices of the AMS, for example, there have been some, some, some articles about you know, important articles uh, uh, about uh, about formalization or, or mechanization in the AMS. There's not there's not uh, the framework for a sustained exchange. You know, where the people write what they think and then pass on to something else. And there are so many topics to discuss. Uh, and there's no framework for establishing priorities. Is this a priority? I, I think so. I think you've uh, ex you've helped to, uh, to, to explain what the, the stakes are. You know, you, you speculated on, on, some, uh, on, on some possible uh, consequences, some, some developments. But uh, within the mathematics, you know, I, I, I'm writing these, these, these uh, essays in part to stimulate discussion, in part to clarify my own ideas, and in part just to uh, keep the habit of writing you know that that could hand, come in handy if I if if I if if the job of mathematician is eliminated, uh, you know I have to have have some something to fall back on. But I hope you know I'd like to hear what other people think about that. I, I I don't I'm not going to quiz people on on what's been in my Substack newsletter because I think that would be uh, that would be unfair or. But, uh... Yes, there's a question in the chat, which is um, going to a second room, which is a discussion of the world, about the world, and then I'll be back for the second Okay, I was, I was wondering about Vilani. Vilani. He'll, he'll, he's gone off to do something, so he'll. Is the roving mic on? I can't hear. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. I do think that in actual mathematical practice and pedagogy, like that, um, that there are um, yeah, versions of both ideals always at play. Right? So I, I think it's absolutely right that that um, that uh, yeah, w w when people actually um, uh, learn how to advance a mathematical proof, like they uh, they are learning. Um, uh, a, a mix of both ideals, um, but um, uh, yeah, I, I have an I have the impression, at least from my undergraduate education, that the that the explicit picture of what a proof is that um, uh, that tends to predominate in undergraduate curricula is very much a, a, a focus on um, uh, the particular um, a kind of early twentieth century axiomatic interpretation of on the Leibnizian side. 
Yeah. But yeah, but but I think it's an interesting question. I mean, would would it be um, you know, would it be fruitful um, uh, in pedagogy um, yeah, to introduce um, um, a kind of um, yeah, a meta discussion of proof with with some uh, historical background? Yeah. Apologies for have not having the microphone on on earlier, but yeah. Yeah. So so I think if I understand both of you correctly, you, you're saying that when teaching um, we go through the Cartesian version of the proof first and then maybe the Leibnizian one follows and what you're saying is but in our intro to proof courses we only teach the Leibnizian version and we don't really make the Cartesian one explicit is that am I understanding is that a, a sort of good summary and, and you're asking like maybe we should ch change our intro to proof courses to of like version one and version two. <laughs> could, could I interject before? Jer I think maybe Jeremy would, will respond to what I'm, I'm going to say. Because Jeremy made this very salutary uh, suggestion in, in uh, last, the last thing I, I saw of his that uh, philosophy of mathematical practice be renamed just philosophy of mathematics. Because what, what's the point of uh, having philosophy of mathematics that doesn't involve practice? And it seems to me that um, whether or not uh, mathematicians say in the official uh, courses that the ideal is the uh, Leibnizian proof, because that's what you can actually teach systematically in practice, in the practice of mathematical practice, what is visible is the Cartesian ideal. And so when I see Jody Azuni say, uh, evidently, uh, the uh, professional norm of mathematics is the, the Leibnizian one, uh, or formalization, then I wonder, you know, uh, I, you know, when I've met him, you know, he's, he has met mathematicians, I wonder why, why he, why he says that, that's, uh, you know, why it's, it's possible to say things like that. But, but Jeremy, Jeremy would, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I do. So I, I, I do like this distinction between the, the Leibnizian and the Cartesian uh, notion of proof. Um, and I think it raises an interesting question, right? So on the one hand, we tell students, um, the ideal is, you know, this, um, this, this, this thing where everything is checked down to axiomatic primitives and there are rules and so on. In practice, we do something else, right? We read, we understand, we rely on expertise, we, we, we trust experts, we, there's this entirely other thing we do. Um, this raises an interesting philosophical project, problem, right? There's a question, there's a clear question, right? The ideal is A, we do B. What does B have to do with A? Is there, you know, what is? Um, and so, you know, I recently wrote a paper called uh, The Reliability of Mathematical Inference, where I, I kind of, I mean, I think the biggest contribution was really just to set up the question, right? There are these two views, but implicitly, you know, they're, they're related that doing B is supposed to somehow, you know, <laughs> accomplish A. You say, here's the ideal, here's what we do. Um, and so I just want to raise, the, I mean, so in, in that paper, I, I tentatively start to you know, try to develop an answer. But I think, you know, I think thinking about this, saying that, yes, there are these two things, and can we tell, can we fill out that story about, about how it works? I think that's, that's an important challenge. Emily. So maybe just a small suggestion as someone who teaches intro to proofs, I always end with uh, the last week or the last class on uh, deconstructing mathematical proofs after we've spent the semester learning to construct them. And it's exactly to raise these questions with students and, you know, mention recent examples like ABC or in like some of the computer proofs and just give them the opportunity to think critically about what they've just learned. Interestingly, the, the reason that ABC is not accepted by the math community is because Schultz gave a gut feeling response to it. This is something that was mentioned earlier in this discussion. He didn't say, this is exactly the point where the argument is wrong. He said, you know, the, the techniques developed cannot be used to, to draw these conclusions because I have a very strong gut feeling. I think, I think you're talking about further in the past. He's, he's got a specific lemma in Mochizuki's paper that He's well, he says the proof is wrong. No, no, I mean, it's corollary, whatever, 3.14 yeah. or 2.13. But he says, you know, the things that have been built up clearly aren't strong enough. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a gut feeling claim because Mokizuki is unable to refute it. 
Yeah, his reputation is you need to work harder. His reputation is you don't under, you, you, his reputation to Schultz's claim is your gut feeling is not correct. You see, and so really what is, you know, the conversation has gone is now not really mathematics in the sense that I understand it. So. Okay, I wanted to address the, uh, the A and B, the, the uh, Leibnizian and Cartesian um, and why we do education as we do. And I think we're missing here the socio sociological impact. I mean, students, unless they've been in some elite high school program, they come to university, they've done calculations as, and they've been very successful at them to get through high school and do a math degree. And we have to shock them out of it and tell them that's not what's really going on in mathematics, right? This, what's going on is proof and the sense of a solid structure. And so we, we teach this, this sort of Hilbertian dream really appropriately. I mean, it's, it's exactly how you want to train a mathematician to think. And then yeah, it's not quite that simple, but, but I do think it's, it's very valid to start the education of mathematician with there is a there is a solid structure of proof and deduction that that you need to internalize that's that's part of our process and then secondarily as well the process has a little little uh you know rough hedges compared to the dream we just told you so i think what we're doing is right i think what emily described is great i mean say all that and then the end say well you know yeah i think that's exactly right I just want to register my disagreement with that perspective. I think it's, uh, you know, it's 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 a uh, uh, it's a way of, of it's a description that doesn't correspond to the practice. And if the description doesn't correspond to the practice, then uh, one should also we should seek a description that does uh, conform to the practice and say. But of course, that's difficult to teach, right? Oh no! But of course, you can train people to to give human rigorous proofs, but of course that's what people do. But to say that this is an approximation to some hypothetical formalization, that is not, that's the way, uh, that's, the, that's, that's what Jody Azuni said, is the, is the professional norm. And I, I contend that that's not the professional norm and the proof that it's not the professional norm is that that's not what people do. You know, the practice is to give something uh, that is, a, that is, you know, it's the, the, the nature of, of human proof has, has evolved radically over centuries, millennia, and uh, what's, what's considered uh, valid, whether drawing a picture is considered valid or not, that's uh, you know, historically uh, variable. And uh, you know, that's fine, you, know, you can describe it whatever way you like, but it, the fact is that uh, the practice, in, instead of say, asking why, uh, how does it work, even though the practice doesn't conform to the model, uh, just say, how does it work? And then you know, forget about the second part of the, of the question. But this is maybe because I'm, uh, but you do not teach going back to the axioms. I mean, I don't believe it because. There's maybe also a difference between saying it's the pro uh, professional norm and saying that it's an ideal. And I just wanted to make a very small comment that just popped into my head. Uh, Terence Tao has this blog post about pre-rigorous, um, rigorous and post-rigorous stages yeah. in mm -hmm. um, mathematical understanding mm -hmm. and, and working in a subject, etc. And I think that um, it doesn't exactly map with Leibniz and, and Descartes, but I think it's very related. And I think what he's saying is that Part of the thing you have to go through the rigorous stage is one of his claims, but you shouldn't stop there. You have to go to the post rigorous stage. It's sort of, so somehow you go from a Cartesian via Leibnizian back to Cartesian understanding or, or a way of proving things working in a certain field. And so that's what Emily is trying to teach somehow in some, in some sense, the post, the post rigorous stage. And I think it's a very good idea that it should be mentioned because it's a very important part of mathematics. And then, then the question is, can we teach the computer to do that? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking just about mathematics education. And so sort of riffing on Andrew says, unless you end up in some high school advanced program, you, you come in not knowing what mathematics is or thinking it's calculation, right? 
Um, and I, I, I struck by this idea that kids might come into university, you know, in 20 years, having played, I, Kevin, I understand you have this thing called like the, the, the natural numbers game, right? Um, but they actually come in with uh, this crazy idea that math is a video game. And uh, Jeremy, you said, oh, then you, then you use the sledgehammer, right? And I had this literal image of, you know, a kid with a character, right, sledgehammering and the axiom pops out and he you know, grabs it and glues it together. And the, they might actually come in with a completely different notion of mathematics than has ever happened before. And that, could, that actually could happen. That they come in, in fact, closer to A, in Jeremy's language, they, they come in thinking, really being really good at manipulating axioms the way that right now people are really good at manipulating you know, blocks in Minecraft. There's, there's no reason that they, you, you might not have a completely different chunk of undergraduates. And that might actually help us go to Emily's point, like what's, gonna, what's the future of mathematics? Well, the future of any subject is what the students come in wanting to learn and thinking that the subject's about. I, I think one of the things, over, sorry, sorry, go on. I'm gonna turn it over to Philip, but I just wanted to make one really quick comment, which is that one of the first things I tell my students in my Intro to Proofs class is that we haven't lost the calculations and we cannot teach things like baby, uh, proofs and baby number theory if our students can't do any calculations at all because they just can't do that basic proof by induction and so we it's not as though we can lose those calculations that, that skill with calculation when we're starting to try to prove make gives proofs but I see that Philip has a hand up so I'll turn over you're muted Philip thank you're you muted. <laughs> um I haven't been able to attend all the talks but I really enjoyed the ones I have and and this discussion. Um, just to put a finer point on it, the question I have is, um, although I'm, I'm very sympathetic with a lot of the concerns about formalization and its potential impact on mathematics, the question that I get stuck on, and which I think is underlying this moment right now is, do we think that formalization will bring about a democratization of mathematics? Um, in other words, will there be more people doing mathematics in the future because of this than, than there are now? And, and but, but what follows quickly on that, when I think about that question, though I'd like to hear what people think, um, is when we talk about formalization and gamifying mathematics, um, are we saying that engineering is the best approach to education or to the kinds of mathematics that we want to be doing? And my sense is that by and large engineering, and this is obviously a, a contentious point, um, has not brought about positive changes in education. Um, that the digitization, the online move in education by and large has not produced results that, that we might be proud of. Um, but those are my main two questions. Thank you. Who wants to take that? Johan. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. And um, so this question about democratization, I think my, one very uh, gloomy future that might happen is that if you need a lot of computer resources to get there first when proving a theorem, then it becomes something that only a very few people can do. Like you need to be at a prestigious institute or one of the big industry players and otherwise you you're just out of luck um, on the other hand like the natural number game can basically be played on on a crappy old phone roughly speaking which does sort of democratize access to things and so it, it can go both ways and I don't know what to think I was just going to add, I think that's a really good point. So uh, people are, are have, um, for example, with these large language models, they've made uh, a version that's open access in France. Um, I think I was talking with, maybe you were around, but in general, it all ties back to, you know, we need to be mindful of where we're going. And so it's, it's, it's great that uh, um, actually I suggested this, this uh, kind of forum to look at that question. And Michael has been like really <laughs> guiding a lot of this. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I think I'm just going to repeat what, what others are saying. But Philip, I, I really like the question. Uh, so I have you know, expressed a lot of optimism in, in the power of using formal methods to teach. I think it is a really good teaching tool you know, when, used, uh, when used well. 
Um, but one has to take care. I mean, a, a model that, that I got from Leo is that, you know, he points out that lots of kids today learn how to program just, just by playing around. I mean, you know, it's accessible. You can kind of learn, you can read a little bit and then try writing a program and see what happens right away. And so, you know, kids learn how to program a lot on their own a lot more easily than they learn how to prove or do mathematical reasoning. And so the hope is that having tools like lean and formal methods will let them kind of play around and experiment and, and reason and get feedback. Um, so that's the hope. And, 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 but I'm, I'm well aware that there, there are concerns and it could backfire and we have to be careful about it. Um, but while I want, I just want to recommend, there's, there's one very good book um, uh, on this topic. It's uh, written by Justin Reich. It's called uh, Failure to Disrupt. Um, and I highly, it, it's really about, you know, education, uh, technology, and, you know, ed tech, technology and education and all the hyperbole. And as the title suggests, you know, that it has not lived up to their hyperbole. Uh, the overall conclusion, though, I think is, is exactly the right one. He says, look, the, the technology has promised. There, there are lots of issues. It's not, it's not going to be incremental. It's going to be a lot of work. So don't expect a magic bullet, um, but you know the technology has has progress has promise, and we just have to figure out how to use it well. If I understand the question correctly, it's about involving a broader audience than is traditional. And I think uh, I'm afraid to be very cynical, but I think there's no end of ways that um, society is trying to include more people, um, particularly people from poorer backgrounds, and they rarely do much to change the equation. I mean, it's, this is beyond our, our little world. And uh, the, the ability to include people who don't come from a, a life position where certain things are valued, it's very, very difficult for them to participate in an intellectual world like this. So they may be able to program in a particular language for a particular game, whether those skills can be broadened to where they're useful professionally. That's the sort of thing I think where it's very difficult for people to necessarily transition, which isn't say some people can't, but I just think in general it's very, very hard. I'm thinking, I mean, I, I want to follow up on this. It's a really great question. And I think Emily put her finger on it earlier on when she said, okay, are we going to define mathematicians as people paid to prove theorems? And opening up the university to people who don't look like people at a university is hard. It takes a long time. What's exciting to me is and particularly just sort of hearing the energy around like the lean community, for example. I mean, if you look at like, what's the, what's the most complex analytical mathematical thinking happening in developing countries, probably computer hacking, right? Probably computer security on both the white hat and the black hat side, right? That's where people are actually attacking problems, looking at interesting things who, you know, would, they're, they're never going to end up in a university. And so you look to those places, right? So, you know, uh, who's doing formal languages in, I don't know, pick your demographic group that's, that's not in the university, right? Uh, people writing Haskell code for blockchains, right? Like the best functional programmers are there. So I think, you know, if, if you're going to broaden your notion of what mathematics is, and I think one of the nice things about things like Lean is that it enables mathematics to escape the university um, because the thing actually, I mean, it's kind of nuts, right? It can validate your proof. You don't have to go, you know, knock on someone's door as happened to you, right? Someone knocks on your door and there's a 14 year old and says, can you read my proof? Actually, this is amazing. Like it doesn't have to happen anymore. That's actually, that gives me the chills. And right, I mean, so being, I mean, and so, okay, look, there's, there's some losses there. Mathematics might change, but I, I feel really sanguine about it. And I, I, I don't feel sanguine about the tenure track positions being there, right? I don't feel sanguine about that. I think, yeah, we're gonna, you know, you guys are all gonna become adjuncts even, right? it's a nightmare. But, um, you know, thinking, I mean, mathematics is an old discipline, right? You're older than science. So the 5,000 year future, this, we might look at, look back on this and say, yes, there was this awful period when in order for someone to check your proof, you had to get a PhD. Can you imagine, right? It'd be like having to mail your punch cards in to get, to get compiled. So anyway, that's the, I just could be optimistic. You're frowning, Andrew, you, you don't, you don't see this. I'm not going to let Andrew answer. Oh, okay. So no, no. Sorry, <laughs> um, I th think I would like to end on that slightly optimistic note and uh, hand over to Kumar for, but let me first of all, thank all the panelists and thank everybody for the discussion.